What's going on, guys? This is Steve Heider here with Gate City Sports Channel. And um, today we're going to take a look at the Eagles 53-man roster. As of yesterday at 4 p.m., the roster's been set. Um, we're going through this waiver period now. We'll see if the Eagles add anybody, which, let's be all honest, we all know they're going to add a tight end. And uh, let's take a look at what the roster looks like, what it tells us about the Eagles, what the future contracts are, what's going on in the world of the Eagles, guys. All right. Be back in a second. This is what the greatest thing about sports is. You play to win the game. E-A-T-L-E-S, Eagles! Breaking down the Eagles um, offensive depth chart, or let's not call it a depth chart because they haven't said depth chart yet. It's just called the Eagles offensive roster. The Eagles went with three quarterbacks, four running backs, two tight ends. Bit of a surprise because... Richard Rodgers kind of really messed up the plan. Like I was telling you all, I highly doubt the Eagles were going to carry four tight ends. They even surprised me by only carrying two, but let's be honest, they're going to add somebody. There's going to be a third tight end. Five wide receivers. I thought they went a little light at wide receiver. Ten offensive linemen. I thought they went way too heavy at offensive line. I think they should have cut back an offensive lineman, added a wide receiver. That's my perspective, but that's not what happened. So. Let's get into the particulars of what the Eagles did in terms of who's on this roster. Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz is the money man of this Eagles roster. He is the star. He is the future of this Eagles team. We knew that way before his deal got restructured and redone. All right, Carson Wentz. Let's talk about what he is. He's a six foot five, two hundred thirty seven pound, twenty six year old quarterback coming from a small school. Um, within his first and second years, he took away a lot of the doubts about playing at a small school. And if he could play to this level of competition, I don't think there's anyone with a rational sense who still has that in their discussion. We know this kid can play to the competition level. What's the only concern with Carson Wentz? Well, this kid plays by the seam of his pants. He can be reckless at times. He can expose himself to injury. He's not brittle. He's not fragile. He's not Sam Bradford. But nonetheless, because he plays hero ball, he can really open himself up to missing games. With that in mind, I think the Eagles know who he is. I think the Eagles know there's always going to be a possibility of injury with Carson Wentz because he wants to win championships. He's not looking to dink and dunk. I'm not saying that he shouldn't dink and dunk at times and live to play another series, live to play another game, live to play another season. But nonetheless, the Eagles knew who he was, and they brought in Josh McCown to be the backup here. Josh McCown is a 40 year old. Um, experienced veteran. He's got adequate arm strength. He knows how to read defenses. You know, he makes sense. He's here on a one-year, $2.45 million salary cap hit for us. I'm not getting into the particulars of anyone's contract, guys. It's, it's too complicated, but I'm just looking at their salary cap hit because that's all that matters to us. We could care less how much they're actually being paid. We care about how it affects the team and the salary cap's how it affects the team. Um, behind him is Nate Sudfeld, who's making, ironically, $3.095 million. My real question is, is Nate Sudfeld, he didn't sustain the injury to his wrist. What do we be talking about Josh McCown? Because to me, this is a wasted roster spot with three quarterbacks. It's unnecessary. You can carry your third quarterback on the practice squad. But because either the Eagles aren't completely confident in Nate Sudfeld yet, or because of Nate Sudfeld's injury, we're carrying three on the roster. Josh McCown's a great quarterback. I'm not knocking that pick up because... This kid can come in and win some games if we had to. If we had him come in for a two or three game stretch, he could do it. Um, my concern is, is where does that leave Nate Sudfeld? Because Nate Sudfeld is a free agent following this year. How does he feel about the Eagles now that they brought Josh McCown in because he bumped up his wrist? Is it only because he bumped up his wrist or is it a lack of confidence? Because let's be real, if this is a lack of confidence, the chances of us retaining Nate Sudfeld are about zero. So that's where my concern lies with that particular situation, which is looking at 2020. What is our backup situation? Is this going to be a cycle where we're always looking for that vet? And there's nothing wrong with always looking for that vet. But, you know, it would be nice to have a developmental guy that maybe we could flip for future, you know, draft position one day. So that's my thoughts there. Okay. Four running backs. And those four running backs are pretty much who every one of us thought they were going to be. Jordan Howard. Miles Sanders. Darren Sproles, and Corey Clement. My main concern here is when we look at this is that for a one-year window, this is a very, very good running back room. 
With that said, none of these guys are making big bank here. We're spending two point, we're basically we're spending two million. It's 2.025 million, but two million on Jordan Howard to be our lead back. Sanders is at $974,000. Okay, bumps up to 1.2 million next year. Darren Sproles is on a $1.33 million contract for this year. Salary cap hit. I'm only talking about salary cap hit, guys. And then Corey Clement's on a $648,000 contract. The main issue is the only guy that's under contract for 2020 is Miles Sanders. Um, I think we'll be able to get Corey Clement. Up. We'll get a deal done. He'll probably get make one or two million dollars next year. I mean, we'll get a, we'll get a deal done with Corey Clement. I don't I don't doubt that, but it is concerning because I think adding back Darren Sproles took away the possibility of having a third back under contract for the following year. Maybe we can work out something with Jordan Howard, but I doubt it. I think Jordan Howard's going to want to be a featured back. I think we'd have to really sell. He'd have to really want to play in Philadelphia, because while I think a lot of you guys are over you're overselling Miles Sanders and his ability to take this job from Jordan Howard within the first like half of the season. I don't think it's going to happen. I honestly don't think that would happen until late, late in the season. If Miles Sanders proves to be what we think he's going to be. And I do think he will be what we think he will be. My real question for you is what is the offensive identity of this team? What is our identity? Because if our identity is, is that we keep you guessing you're trying to figure out us from, Oh my God, they're in 12, they're in 13, man. You know, Oh gosh, now they're lining up in the 20 man, 21 man personnel. Like, if that's our identity, is that we're going to confuse the crap out of you. We're going to beat you down with this basic playbook that just has a lot of moving pieces and a lot of skilled players. Then how do we hold the lead once we get it? Because when we won the Super Bowl, how did we win that Super Bowl? We won that Super Bowl not with players like Miles Sanders, not with players like Shady McCoy. We won that Super Bowl with Jay Ajayi, LeGarrette Blunt, Corey Clement. We run, we've won that Super Bowl with players who can catch the ball to the backfield, like Corey Clement, and players who can pound and run the ball down your throat, like Jay Ajayi and LeGarrette Blunt. That's the reality of it. That's where my question lies. When you talk about Miles Sanders taking over this team, is Miles Sanders a guy we can run down your throat in the fourth quarter? Look, I'm not saying that he isn't that guy. I'm saying that's a lot to prove, especially over a proven guy like Jordan Howard. So. That's my thoughts there. Tight end. We carry two tight ends, and that was the surprise for everybody. I, I didn't hear one person who, when they set their initial 53-man roster, said two tight ends. I would have thought we would have used a placeholder on a guy like Perkins and or Alex Ellis and then upgraded it later if we wanted to. Go in a couple weeks into the season and, and say, okay, guys, thank you for your service, but we're going to cut you, put you on the practice squad because we still would like to develop you. but we, we need to move in a different direction for this season because we need an, an adequate and a serviceable third tight end. I had been screaming from the top of my lungs on all my videos that some of you guys that were calling for four tight ends are not being realistic. I don't care if we're going to run a lot of 12-man personnel. If you're saying you're going to carry four tight ends, you're taking a roster spot away from somebody. And on top of taking a roster spot away from somebody, you're also advocating the fact that if Goddard or Ertz went down, you think that a guy like Alex Ellis or you think a guy like uh, Perkins was going to take away reps from a guy like Darren Sproles, Miles Sanders, right? Um, Nelson Aguilar, J.J. Ortega-Whiteside. It's not realistic. I mean, it made no sense. Um, I was shocked, though, with the two tight ends. My prediction is when we get to the defensive side is, is that basically we have a placeholder for that third tight end. And that placeholder is at the linebacker position, and it's T.J. Edwards. Um, basically speaking, T.J. Edwards, he's a good prospect. Why expose him to waivers this early if you don't need to? Let these teams fill up on guys and see if later on in a couple of weeks, if we couldn't cut TJ Edwards and get him onto the practice squad since these teams would already be filled up, would there be as much temptation to claim a guy like TJ Edwards? That's my thoughts on is that TJ Edwards is simply a placeholder for the time being, but I'm going to get to that when we get to the defensive side of the ball. Um, that's my thoughts. So TJ Edwards is a placeholder for that third tight end. And when you look at a guy who's a special teams ace and really a young guy in Rudy Ford. I think Rudy Ford is holding Jalen Mills's position. Now you could flip that over and say like, well, no, maybe we hold TJ Edwards for six, seven, eight games. And he's the holder for Jalen Mills when Jalen Mills gets back. And then Rudy Ford would be that holder for basically that third tight end. You could say either or. My suspicion would be that no, Rudy Ford is technically, he's holding that spot for Jalen Mills and TJ Edwards is holding that spot for that third tight end. But Either or, 
it's not a big deal, however you want to shape that up. Wide receivers. We kept five. Um, it's hard to disagree with anything the Eagles do, especially from a front management standpoint, because we're so good in that front management. However, I think it was a mistake. We don't have a need for 10 offensive linemen. We don't. We have enough guys who can fill in. Guys, you're only going to dress seven or eight offensive linemen, so why the hell are you keeping 10 on your roster? It just doesn't make any damn sense. Matt Pryor is not that great of a prospect that needs to be held on this roster. I like Matt Pryor. I would love to keep him on the practice squad and develop him because I think down the road he could be a piece for us, but I don't give a damn if he got signed away. We can find another Matt Pryor. That's not a big deal. We found Nate Herbig this year. Not a big deal. You could have done the same thing with Nate Herbig if you really wanted Matt Pryor. You can make the same argument, although I think Nate Herbig has more utility than Matt Pryor this year because Matt Pryor is not taking away snaps from, from Palapuli, Biotai. It's not happening. He's not going to take away snaps from a person like Isaac Suomalo. Right, you could argue that he's way more prepared than Jordan Malata, and yeah, like probably so. But I just I don't you know Andre Dillard can bounce inside and can play tackle. Like, what are you really holding the spot for? Doesn't make any damn sense. You should have added your six wide receiver. My opinion should have been Greg Ward Jr. Or God, I would have taken Markin McKell as well. I mean, either one of those guys are way better down the road type guys to keep on this roster especially when you look at the future of the wide receiver roster on this team. Like, for God's sakes, what the hell were you thinking? That's just not the right move that you guys made. That was a horrible move. Greg Ward should have been on this roster, or Mark and Mikel should have been on this roster. Look, I'm not arguing Matt Collins. I think a lot of people are overblowing. Matt Collins can't play. They don't know shit about anything. They really don't. Most of y'all that are out there talking, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Matt Collins is good enough to be on an NFL roster. That's not the problem. And this is coming from a guy who's an NC State fan. Matt Collins played at UNC. I effing hate UNC. So if I'm telling you he can play, he can damn play. Matt Collins has always had an injury history. He had it at UNC. It's the reason why he wasn't a first, second, third round pick. Because it's not from a skill standpoint. The kid can play special teams. The kid can play the wide receiver position. The kid's been banged up. And I still think, you look at his freaking preseason performance, and you look at his training camp performance, he was still clearly banged up. Because he did get outplayed by Greg Ward. He did get outplayed by Mark Hinn McKell. And he's a better talent than both of them, combined. So clearly he's still banged up. With that said, I would have put Greg Ward Jr. on this roster. Because Nelson Aguilar is making $9.387 million this year on our salary cap. Like, Deshaun is at a very reasonable rate this year at 3 mil. And he's at a very reasonable rate next year at 8 mil. Very reasonable. Alshon Jeffrey is our highest paid player this year, and he's making 14.725 mil, and he jumps up to 15.9, so basically 16 mil the next two years, which for the uh, level of talent that Alshon Jeffrey is, is not unheard of. It's not unreasonable. And the guy likes Philly so much, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt if he wouldn't take a two, $3 million pay, pay cut to stay here the following two years. Okay? I think we're very healthy at receiver with Deshaun Jackson, who's going to be here for two to three years. There is a possible out. Basically, when we, when we say out, guys, this is what we mean by an out. It's when the dead cap money is less than your actual salary cap figure. So basically, we save money by letting you go. That doesn't really happen with Deshaun Jackson until 2021, and, and he's still too important to the roster, and he's only making 10.9 mil at that point. We probably can restructure his contract, probably bring him down to 7, 8 mil. He probably would take it. He probably will retire an eagle. So Alshon, Deshaun, J.J. Ortega is going to be here for a long time. His freaking cap number makes a lot of sense. Matt Collins' cap number makes sense for the next two years. He's under a mil for the next two years. It would have been really nice to have Greg Ward Jr. or Mark Hinn as well for the next two to three years. Maybe we do. Hoping the hell we get these guys on the practice squad because we're going to need them the next couple of years. Maybe we draft. I, you know, there's draft. There's all these variables, guys. But I'm just saying it would have made a hell of a lot more sense to have kept Greg Ward Jr. or Mark Hinn over. Matt Pryor, even Jordan Malata, bye. I'm sorry, guys. I know Jordan Malata can be a major prospect, but I'm not going to shed a damn tear about the guy. We got plenty of talent and depth along this offensive line. Me personally, I would have kept and done exactly what the Eagles did with Jordan Malata. I would stash him for one more year and give him one more year to prove himself. But let's be real. Jordan Malata is not coming in and playing any games anytime soon. So I think you made a mistake. Greg Ward would have helped immediately. You're looking for the immediate future with this particular roster, not projections. 
Come on. Okay. Let's look up and down this offensive line. We kept 10 of them. We kept one to too many. We shouldn't have kept this many offensive linemen. It makes no damn sense. This is clearly a lack of Joe Douglas being here. This is Howie Ra Roseman and our coaching staff and our – they're just – this is fear. This is fear. And I get it, man, because if you take too many injuries at the offensive line position, you're screwed. I get it. I get it. I'm not faulting them for being scared for this position, but I just feel like you got to roll the dice every now and then. And we didn't roll the dice here. We kept a guy – you shouldn't be on this roster. And Matt Pryor, there's no reason for this kid to be on this roster right now. Practice squad bodies, where he should be. Jason Peters, he's here for one more year on $8.66 million contract. It's a fair contract for what this guy is to us. I'm not going to say that he won't be back for one more season next year. We might sign him for like a three, $4 million contract, but I can't see him getting more than $5 million to come back for the play for the Eagles. I love Jason Peters, love everything he's done for the city. But to be real with you, we won a Super Bowl without him. So I love the guy. I love everything he does. He's developing our talent. He's been more than what you can ask for. That was one of the greatest trades of all time. Probably the greatest trade of all time, if we're going to be real. Isaac Suomalu, very fair. He's here for another few years. It's, you know. Uh, he's basically an out after it looks like to me about 2021 is his last year here. Then he's got these two years that are just really weird on the contract. I'm not going to try to get into that. But basically, we retain him for under $6 million for the next two to three or three to four years, basically. $2.44 million against the cap this year. He's $6 million against the cap next year. He's oh, – I'm sorry. I'm reading that wrong, guys. I'm reading Kelsey. So Milo is $1.739 million against the cap this year. He's $4 million against the cap next year, $4.9 million against the cap the following year, and then he's five point nine million the following year. So, very fair. This kid can play. He's developed. I like him. Let's keep him. Uh, Kelsey. Kelsey's $2.44 against the cap this year, $6.4 against the cap the following year, and $8.4 following year. He'll never see $8 million. Not at his age. He's a great player. I think he's exactly three years left in him. We have exactly three years to figure out a plan for this guy. He's not going to make $8 million. I highly doubt that, you know. But, hey, we got a guy for a couple more years who's one of the best centers in the league. Brandon Brooks is one of our highest paid players. He's costing us 11.9, 11.4. This is a guy I think we need to do something about because he's way overpaid. He needs to be back down into reality of that $7, 8000000 million figure. I know he's an all-pro. He's also injured. And let's be real, I'm not paying any fucking right guard in the football. $11 million. It's way too high. That figure needs to come down. Um, Lane Johnson, 7 mil, 13 mil, 13 mil. This guy's the future of the offensive line projecting forward with Andre Dillard. Yeah, he's being paid reasonably. So, yeah, of course, man. Andre Dillard's 2.2 mil, followed by 2.8 mil, followed by 3.3 mil, followed by 3.9 mil. I mean, he's getting paid fair. He's on a rookie contract. He's a first-round pick. He's the future, along with Lane Johnson and Isaac Sulamalu. I'd like to see this, you know, this kid really take over next year. I think this kid's going to be something special. Um, Halapoli is on a very, very reasonable deal for us this year at 2 mil. It's kind of shocking to see what he's making, actually. At 2 mil, like, that's a hell of a deal. Like, all you guys have thought we were going to trade him for Jadavion Clowney when he's on 2 mil. Like, hell no, that was never going to happen. To be real with you, I wouldn't be shocked to see this kid not retained again. This kid can play. He's not an all-pro. He's not, you know, he's like Isaac Sulamalo. He's not an all-pro, but he plays in an upper level. We won a Super Bowl behind this kid. Like, he's athletic. He can play guard. He can play tackle. Like, I'd like to see something happen here. This kid is good enough to be on our team. I would love to see us figure out a way of extending, extending this kid for the next three or four years because of the, at the least, if we figure out a way of getting Brandon Brooks under $10 million for the next couple of years, which needs to happen, like somebody's going to want this kid a whole hell of a lot. We probably can get a second round pick out of him, if not better, return on him because this kid can play left or right tackle for somebody. He can damn sure play right tackle, guard. He can be that kind of swing for us, and he can start for us, no doubt about it. Nate Herbig, got him for three years. He's on a reasonable contract. Guy's only making like $500,000. Like he's he's reasonable. 
he looked good, man. He looked really good in training camp. He looked really good in preseason. I'm excited to see how this kid turns out. Jordan Mulata, very reasonable contract. We got him for three more years, basically on that contract. We'll see how he works out. I think I think he's he's in line to do some damage next year. I mean, he he got beat a few times in the preseason and it looked ugly for a couple of plays, but he looked good for the for overall. Matt Pryor. I'm not gonna say any more Matt Pryor. He shouldn't be on this roster. One last thing to talk about with the offense and free agency and everything that's going on with these roster cutbacks and stuff like that is Shady McCoy. I, look, I would love to have him back just because I really hate the way that he was let go from Philadelphia. That whole Chip Kelly thing, like if there's anything we could redo, and I hate to say redo because maybe then we don't end up with the Super Bowl a few years later. We don't end up with, you know, Doug Peterson as our coach. So, I mean, you know, it's hard to say. But that said, like, I hated the way that he was just ungloriously taken out of Philadelphia. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't know what he fits. Do we really need Shady McCoy for our offense? Like, I, just, I can't see what he fits. I'm not going to sit here and say that he wouldn't be the best player on this roster at running back because he probably would. But Miles Sanders is still probably going to be the future of this team. We're going to need a thumper behind Miles Sanders, and I just don't know that that's – you know what I mean? Like, right now our we're set up to have Jordan Howard as the main featured back as, as our thumper with Miles Sanders as a change of pace back. And I think going into next year we're going to have – Miles Sanders as the main featured back, who's more of that elusive, can catch screens of the backfield, can pick up blitzes with a thumper behind him to close out games. So I, I don't know how Shady would fit. I, I don't. I mean, I know a lot of people are saying, like, oh, he could mentor. I don't know if Shady's that guy, though. I don't know that Shady McCoy is a mentor type back. I don't think it's, he's still too young for that. I still think he wants to be a featured back. Like, you know, it sucks, but it is what it is. Defense. Let's talk some defense, guys. So we kept six defensive ends. I said that. We were just way too talented there not to keep six. And can you imagine if Joe Osman was still healthy? Like how hard this cutback would have been. Um, defensive tackles four. To be real with you, I think you could have. I don't know, man. I think we we should have kept Trayvon Hester, man. I mean, the, the guy can play. He's a really good special teams player. He can fill in adequately a defensive tackle. I think we should have gone five there because Hassan Ridgeway should. I'm not saying he should have been let go in favor. Like, no, no, we should have kept five because we had five really good defensive tackles. Linebackers, we kept six. It's one too many. I like TJ Edwards, guys. I'm not I'm not putting down TJ Edwards. I think TJ Edwards can play. I don't think he's a fit for this scheme. But at the same time, neither is Nigel Bradham. It's not that they can't play in this scheme, but they're not nickel type backs. They're not dime type backs and like like linebackers. So I mean, Nigel Bradham has been more than serviceable. But it's not his natural positioning. Like, he's, he's out of place with us. So, I mean, you can argue TJ Edwards could do the same. But I think Edwards is definitely the odd man out once we get that tight end. Um, quarterbacks, we technically have five. But really, we got six because we got Jalen Mills on the pup. And Mills will come back to OB6. We'll drop a linebacker or we'll drop a safety down to five or to down to four. So that's the way things are going to work out. And I can pretty much guarantee you that. Um, safeties are at five. Like I said, Rudy Ford is here on that fifth one. He's basically holding a spot until we can get Jalen Mills back. Um, the reason I, the main reason I'm saying that Rudy Ford is the holdover from Mills and not TJ Edwards is, is that Rudy Ford is this good of a special teams player. TJ Edwards is this good of a special teams player. You know what I'm saying? Um, Edwards, I think, is really just. We're doing the best we can to get him through to the practice squad to keep hold of him. And I think that holding him on the roster until we got the tight end we wanted, maybe even keeping him on this roster for a couple of games. I don't think Edwards is going to dress out for any of those games because we're only going to, what, 46 players, I think, to run out dress. So I don't think he's going to be one of those 46. But still, he's a good ball player. Like, we would love to develop him. And as I get into this talk of, of what we got going on here, you guys will see what I'm saying. Like, we got a lot of decision when it comes to linebacker, and TJ Edwards might be in the future of this linebacking room come down the road another year. So let me jump into that. Okay, six defensive ends. The six defensive ends are exactly who we think they are. They're Graham, Barnett, Curry, Hall, Sweat, Miller. 
and it's exactly the order I would put them in currently. I think Sweat might be ahead according to the coaching staff. And let's be real. Some of you guys that are saying Deshaun Hall is so much better than Sweat, I'm going to tell you to pump your brakes. You could be correct. But keep in mind, Hall didn't go up against the same level of competition that Sweat did. So I, I think we got to pump our brakes on that a little bit. Um, however, he showed way more. And I think that he is, from a pass rushing standpoint, I think he's a little more refined at this point than Sweat is. However, my real big concern with defensive ends is what are we going to do past this year? Because Curry's only on a one-year deal. Deshaun Hall has two more years left on his deal. Um, Sweat has – he's got three years on his deal. Treve Miller's got the longest amount of time with us. And then, you know, we look at someone like Brandon Graham. Are we really going to pay Brandon Graham $13.75 million next year? Brandon Graham has the highest jump in salary of any player. He goes from $3.5 million this year against the cap to $13.75, $13.375 million against the cap next year. That's a big, big jump. Um, we'd have to clearly restructure Graham's contract. I just don't know that we're going to do that for next year. And I don't think his dead cap number really works out for us until the following year in 2021. So. That's a hard one to say, man. That's a big jump in salary. The other one is Fletcher Cox. I just, I can't see us paying $24 million, almost $25 million for a defensive tackle. That's quarterback money. I don't think it's going to happen. So, I mean, we do got some question marks on that defensive line projecting for the future, but we got some really good young talent. So, I mean, Derek Barnett's on some pretty reasonable numbers, to be real with you. Um, I can see Derek Barnett you know, being that guy, I mean, we, we really need Derek Barnett to step up and, and be that elite pass rusher that we think he's going to be. So my question on defensive line is, is what is Derek Barnett going to show us this year? He's got to be the guy. Um, we got Vinny Carey here for one year. And if you really look at the numbers, guys, there's a reason why Chris Long's not back. There's a reason why we allowed, um, what was his name? Not, is it? You know what I'm talking about? They all, uh, Barnett, Bar you know what I'm saying? The guy from Seattle we had here last year. There's a reason why we let them guys go. Long was on like a five, six million dollar contract. Um, Barrett or Barnett, whatever his name was, from Seattle. The old pass rush writer, and he was a really good ball player, by the way. He was on a seven million dollar contract. So there's a reason why we let them guys go. Um, Perry's on a very, very team friendly two point one eight seven five million dollar contract this year, and Curry could be back for a couple more years. I think he fits that role. Hall's on a very, very, very good contract with a six and seven hundred thousand dollar contract for the next couple of years. Sweat's on a very team friendly contract, seven, eight hundred thousand dollar contracts over the next couple of years. And then Shreve Miller is definitely on, you know, he's a developmental guy. He's on that team friendly. So we got to figure something out there. Fletcher Cox is like making big, big money. Um, Malik Jackson is another one that's a little head scratching because he's on a very good deal this year at two point eight million. It's very fair for Malik Jackson. He jumps up to ten million, which I still think for next year is a very fair contract for the type of player he is. Then he jumps up to that twelve million dollar contract, and that's where I think that twenty twenty one is going to be a very very important year for the defense. We have a lot to figure out on the defensive line for twenty twenty one. Um, Hassan Ridgeway is on a $720,000 contract. I think that he's going to be a guy we extend because I think he can play and I think we want him in that rotation. Tim Jernigan is a head scratcher to me. He's on a $1.625 million contract. Um, he's on a one year prove it deal. You know, Tim Jernigan is a guy I would love to keep in the fold for the next three or four years along with Lynch Jack and Fletcher Cox, but that's going to be really hard to do. Linebacker is an absolute mess. Linebacker. Nigel Bradham's on a $4.635 million deal this year, and that's a very good deal for Nigel Bradham, for the Eagles at least. Um, for Nigel, he jumps up to $9.7 million, and that's a potential out contract. So basically his dead cap hit would be less than his actual salary. Um, my thinking is, is that he's probably going to rework his contract. Um, Camus Brugier Hills on a one-year $720,000 contract. We've got to figure something out with Camus because I'd hate to see Camus walk away. He's a good ball player. Zach Brown's on a $2.5 million deal this year. His fair market value for what he is. I don't know that he'll stick in Philly, but he's a good ball player to have for this year. Nate Gary's on a six dollars and $700,000 contract for the next two years. That's why he's on this team, guys. 
is on a very fair deal. Um, LJ Sports on a $1.4 million deal. He follows it up with a $2 million deal for the next two years, and those are very fair numbers for him. TJ Edwards is on a three-year contract. You know, obviously rookie free agent. They're fair numbers. Five, six hundred thousand dollars. All right. Uh moving past that, our cornerbacks is probably that next one where like past linebackers, the cornerback situation is an absolute mess in terms of the contracts. This year we're very strong. Darby, Jones, Avante Maddox, and Rasul Douglas, um, along with Craven LeBlanc when he comes back healthy, is a very, very good secondary. The crazy thing is, is that what are we going to do here? Because Ronald Darby's on a one-year deal at $2.8 million, and it's a very fair deal for him. Sidney Jones is on a two-year contract remaining on that rookie contract at 1.6 and 1.9. My guess is, is that Sidney Jones had better prove himself this year, because if not, he will not be back. That's my gut feeling here. He will not play out past his rookie contract over the next two years if he doesn't start to prove himself, because he's a young guy. Sidney Jones is a very young guy. We drafted him around 20 years old, guys. He's been playing as a very young man for a few years. The issue is, is that Ronald Darby's also a young man. And Darby is clearly the best cornerback on this team right now. Pass Ronald Darby, your next guy is Avante Maddox. Um, Russell Douglas, Avante Maddox are on very, very fair deals, and they're here for a few more years on those deals. russell has got two more years on that on his contract just like Sidney Jones, but he's under a million dollars on both those years. And then Avante Maddox is under a million dollars for the next three years. Jalen Mills is making $2 million this year. He's going to miss six to probably eight weeks. I don't think he's back. Coaching staff loves him. I think Jalen Mills is a much better player than he's given credit for sometimes, but are you really going to, if Sidney Jones proves to be who we think he is, are you really going to hand Jalen Mills another two or $3 million contract, Ronald Darby another two or $3 million contract, and pay Jalen or Sidney Jones $2 million? No, come on. So the secondary kind of needs to work itself out. Safeties were at five. Like I said, Rudy Ford's here basically until Jalen Mills gets back. Um, Malcolm Jenkins is making $11.3 million this year, which, let's be real, it's fair. He's a good ball player. Um, Rodney McLeod's making $4.8 million this year. He's a great ball player. Andrew Sandejo is making $1.3 million this year. He's a good ball player. Cyprian's making $645,000, so is Rudy Ford. Those two surprised me. Cyprian's a way better player than $645,000. I don't know what's going on there. We'll see. We got a heck of a deal for him this year. There's a reason why he's on this team um my feeling with malkin jenkins is is that he's not going to call like his contract has nothing to do with the money he's making fair market value i think he wants the security of more than two years so i think he wants another three to five year contract with similar figures to what he's already making which i think the eagles will fork over i think we'll get it done um if you look at our defense, who are the highest paid players on our defense right now? Fletcher at 11.9 million, followed by Malcolm at 11.387 million, followed by Rodney McLeod at 4.843 million, followed by Nad Nigel Bradham at 4.635 million, followed by Brandon Graham at 3.5 million, Barnett at 3.5 million, um, Malik Jackson at 2.8 million, Ronald Darby at 2.8 million. Zach Brown at two and a half million, Vinny Curry at two point one mil, and Jalen Mills at two mil. Past that, you get into like Sidney Jones at one point six. You're, now you're getting into like prove it deals and like rookie contracts for first, you know, first second round picks. So you got Sidney Jones, Tim Jernigan, L.J. Fort, and Andrew Sebejo. So <clears throat> it tells us a lot about how the Eagles value. They really value the pass rushers. They value the defensive line heavily. Um. It looks like they're always going to want a guy like Nigel Bradham, Bradham, a very dependable, trustworthy linebacker. And then I think the linebackers are going to really dip down on what they get paid. And then we want two to three really respectable corners, and, but we're not going to go top market value on corner. So what does it tell us about the way things are structured is that after next year, this team's going to be intact, I think, for about two years. 
2021 is going to be really interesting. And I think it's going to tell, 2021 is going to tell us a lot about the identity of the Eagles underneath Howie Roseman and underneath Doug Peterson going forward. Um, but right now, what I see is, is that we're holding TJ Edwards until we really need that tight end. And we're holding Rudy forward until Jalen Mills is healthy. We could switch those around if we really, really value TJ Edwards. We could hold him for six weeks <clears throat> until Mills is healthy and let Rudy Ford go as soon as we find the tight end we want. So we'll see. But that's what's going on. We're going to end up basically having two of these guys come off this defense within the before the halfway point of the season. All right, y'all. That time, and y'all do three things for me. This is my analysis of the roster. Three things, guys. Like, share, and subscribe. Let me add a fourth. Feedback, guys. Comment. Let's talk. What did I say that pissed y'all? Tell me about it. You're wrong, but I'll still talk to you. All right, y'all. Peace. I'm out.